You're watching DATV, bringing Brookline home. I'm Karma Kitai, and I'm your host for A Livelihood, New Adventures as We Age. Today I'm going to introduce you to Bruce Frankel, and Bruce has recently published a book which I was very impressed by, and I'm not easily impressed these days by books about what are we going to do with the rest of our lives, because I've read and reviewed a lot of them, but this one is special. <laughs> So welcome. Well, thank you, Karma. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. So I told you when I read and reviewed your book for my blog that, oh my God, I thought another one of these books. Everybody's writing these books these days. But I just loved your book. Well, it thanks. Was, it, yeah, it's so charming. And the stories, I was just engaged in each one of the stories. Well, thank you. So why don't you talk about how the idea for that book even came about? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the lovely review you did write about it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the story is really fairly complicated in some ways and simple in others, but um, when I was, I had decided when I was in my early 50s, uh, 51, to leave my job as a um, editor at People Magazine or write, I was a a senior writer and editor, and and you had been in that field as a as a journalist for, for what, twenty years. Yes, or so? I, I had been a reporter at USA Today uh, for six or seven years. I was the New York-based national reporter for USA Today and wrote a lot about organized crime and uh, terrorism, uh, the first World Trade Center bombing, and all the trials and and all the major mob trials and hmm. um, trials of uh, major figures. And, but, and I had gone to People Magazine um, for a few years. I, I worked as a senior writer and editor. And um, when I was uh, in, um, in my 40s, a little earlier, I had had uh, cancer and mm -hmm. had at that time begun to feel like the clock was ticking on me and um, decided, had be, really began thinking then probably that I wanted to do, I had started out life wanting to be a poet and um, that aspiration gnawed at me uh, that I had not really succeeded in pursuing that. And so when I was 51, I decided to leave journalism and um, went back to school to get an MFA in poetry at Sarah Lawrence College. And when I um, came out of Sarah Lawrence with my degree um, at 53, I started uh, to teach at the State University of New York. Uh, and to teach poetry? To teach, to teach writing. I was teaching teach writing. A, writing a cross-curriculum, a, a course that I created on painters and poets. Mm -hmm. in their mutual influence. At any rate, um, at about this time, my um, long marriage broke up uh, and um, it was kind of unforeseen and suddenly I faced um, real dilemmas in life and mm -hmm. we were in the midst of uh, renovating an apartment and I had to take over doing that and leave mm -hmm. teaching and worked really doing construction on my own place for about a year. And when all that was done, um, <laughs> life was, had turned upside down a bit, and mm -hmm. I was 
uh, mid 50s and a friend of mine was turning named Jim who was turning 60 and he was a ghostwriter is a ghostwriter had written a number of books and um, we had a ce celebratory lunch at a sushi place to celebrate his birthday but he came and he was distressed because the book that he uh, was about to write and which looked like it would be a, a big money maker for him had blown up in the press and the contract had mm. been lost and so it turned into a rather uh, morbid lunch no. um, and he was severely depressed and and I was oh. trying to figure out what I was going to do too and I went home from that lunch uh, turning over ideas and walked home by the time I reached my apartment I had this rather whimsical idea that I would uh, that we would together collaborate and write a, a book about people who succeeded in life after 60. <laughs> um, and the book would be tremendously successful and we would become successful too at long last. Um, <laughs> but it sounds like you were very successful when you were working as a writer and a, an editor and I right, did, in I major, did, major media. I did well, but mm -hmm. you know, life had, had turned a bit and um, you know, like everybody else, I, I wanted to see a day when I didn't have to worry about um, bills and that sort of thing. But um, I had three sons, two of whom were in college at the time, one in high school. Um, so at any rate, um, I, by the time I reached home that day, I, I called Jim up and I said whimsically, let's do this book. And he hemmed and hawed and wasn't really sure we could figure out a way to do it that would work. He ended up getting another contract for a book, and I was kind of left with my own good mm -hmm. idea, um, which, in truth, it started out as somewhat of a shallow idea. Um, I didn't really know very much about the field of positive aging. I did know that boomers were about to start turning 60 then, now mm -hmm. they're turning 65, yeah. and knew that it would be and, a market. Right, and there is now a field of positive aging. There is. And it's, of course, not very old. Um, I think we've been talking about it for, what, 10 years or yeah. something, maybe? And really, I, uh, I, as I said, I didn't know much, but there were, there were already some very, a couple of very good books. And, um, but mm -hmm. there was nothing I thought that um, did what I wanted to do, which was tell stories with full breadth of individuals so that um, because what, what I always sensed as a reporter was that everyone comes to their stories in very individual ways. Hmm. Um, you can summarize and you can create maps for people, but everyone's story is so uh, intimate and to, to their lives that mm -hmm. um, there may be things that people have in common, but it's useful. And I, I didn't want to write a book that was just prescriptive. I wanted mm -hmm. to write a book in which the you reader. You didn't want to do a, a how-to. I didn't want to how do, to do a book. Right. I didn't want to do a how-to book. I wanted to write mm -hmm. a book that people would read the stories and they would find in the stories themselves things that they could relate to, see mm -hmm. themselves in, and understand how their own stories could change. Mm -hmm. And well, that's interesting when you say that because maybe that's why I liked your book so much because. That's what this TV show is about. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I relate. I mean, I've watched your show, and I, I do think it is what your show is about. And mm -hmm. so that was the genesis of the book. Um, and then it took me about two or three years of um, interviewing and spending time with people and having my own sense of aging change. Because when I left um, Time, Inc. at the age of 51 to go back to school, I really thought my career was over. There was at that time, there had been a big upheaval at Time Inc. as a result of the uh, its uh, business decision to purchase AOL and a lot of people were getting shut out of jobs. It's only gotten worse in truth since then, but um, as journalism has kind of collapsed uh, in the way that, from the way that it once existed. But what I, what I found was as I found these great models for life after 60, people who I chose also in the book, I chose people who had not had great success prior in life. All mm -hmm. but one had had 
fairly modest success in their lives, if any success at all. Mm -hmm. So well, they weren't famous people. They weren't famous, except for one. There was one with wealth, but her, the reason I chose her story, that's Naomi Wilzig, who has the World Erotic Art Museum ah. now. Huh? Um, I chose her story because she had to overcome so many other barriers that wealth was only a, a piece of the picture. Yeah. And um, I really learned over the course of two or three years, I, I, it changed the timeline of my own life rather than seeing life as, mm. and my working life as short circuited and ending maybe when I was 60. Suddenly, um, I realized that there was a great opportunity for um, continuing to be productive and happy and expanding and mm -hmm. challenging myself and all the things that we now talk about, mm -hmm. I really learned from the subjects that in the book. Yeah, and that really defines the field of positive aging, yeah. I think, doesn't it? I, yeah. I think so. I mean, I, yeah. the, the qualities of the people, the things that they did, whether it was becoming a dancer, um, as Thomas Dwyer, who was um, had worked for the CIA um, or the Defense Department in uh, telecommunications. Mm -hmm. um, you can't confirm that he was a spy, but um, you know he worked in telecommunications overseas his entire, mm -hmm. entire life for the Department of Defense. And um, when he was in his mid-50s, Thomas um, got tired of the politics and left uh, the government service and returned and didn't really know what he was going to do with the rest of his life, thought maybe he'd open a detective agency. And one day saw a dance, uh, an elder dance company dancing, uh, which, in which was his brother. Was that the Liz Lerman group? It, it, it wasn't. It was something, well, it was Liz Lerman. It was then called Dancers of the Third Age. And mm -hmm. his brother was a member of it, his older brother, who had been in the State Department. Um, he was also dancing? He was also a dancer. <laughs> he, Okay. And he was very good, in fact. And Thomas was so saw this perform saw this performance at a high school and saw the kids sitting with their mouths agape watching these elder dancers perform. <laughs> and Thomas realized that he felt like he had a mission that would be to show people that you don't have to grow old and sit in a rocker. You could do something. Now, this was a guy who had never danced in his life, had yeah, never been athletic, uh, was an you know, pretty much a 95-pound weakling when he was growing up. Yeah, um, he's still in the pictures that uh, we have. He looks, you know, very skinny and uh, tall, the, right? Well, he he actually lost a great deal of weight as he when he was working as an agent in Kathmandu. He weighed 185 pounds. He now weighs 127. He caught a bug in Kathmandu oh, and gosh. lost a good deal of weight, and then. He was stationed in Vienna, I believe, for a period of time, three years, and he started walking to wa work and lost more. And then when he started dancing, he lost like another 10 pounds. But he stays, he is on an incredible regimen. He's 78. He performed, I think, this past weekend in a dance performance in Washington. He's mm -hmm. remarkable. And yeah, so as I remember from the story, and by the way, that's one of my favorite oh, stories. Good. So when I talk, give that one as an example. But I think he originally started, you know, just participating in dance for fun, but then what, I think he was invited to do it in a more kind of semi-professional way, right? Well, yeah, I'm, he, he did start do, taking lessons, and at that time, Liz Lerman Dance Exchange um, existed in a different way. She had, uh, the dan elder dancers were separated into dancers of the third age, and she had her own company. And then she saw over time, or she had seen earlier that, when she put elder dancers together with youngins, as they like to call them, um, something happened, that there was a transfer of oh. energy and style, and mm -hmm. each learned from the other. And she, she was already doing her community-based uh, dance work. But so she, she combined the two. And oh. so Thomas- it's intergenerational. It's intergenerational, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. and, and Thomas had wanted to do it after he'd taken lessons for about two years. And, and at that point, Liz still had age qualifications, so it, it didn't quite work. But then someone got hurt, and she needed someone to go along and fill a position. They were going, I think, to Belgrade, Yugoslavia. And I think in that case, 
Thomas suspects they were inviting him, part also because he had once been stationed in Belgrade. At that time, it was still a communist nation, and mm -hmm. um, he suspects maybe there was a little bit of interest in protection while he was, <laughs> so, <laughs> at any rate. Yeah, well, that's a wonderful story, but there are many wonderful stories in your book. Thank you. Yeah, so we also have a couple of pictures about a sculptor, right? Yeah, Ted Levitzik. Um, who's also, he has a, a marvelous story and um, again, a tremendously inspirational account. Ted had grown up in Poland in a town called Otwak, uh, which was outside of Warsaw. And um, he, he had grown up there during the Nazi occupation. Uh, his town had been 50% uh, Jewish. Uh, there were 30,000 people in the town at the beginning of the war. One night, the Nazis came in, and 15,000 of them, all Jews, were removed. Mm. Um, his family was Christian, but all his friends were Jewish. Um, at any rate, t um, Ted survived the war and um, managed to escape um, st Stalinist Poland and um, stowed away on a ship, in fact and circuitously ended up in the United States um, mm -hmm. and worked for many years until he was uh, past 60 as a contact lens grinder or maker, mm -hmm. um, which was something he fell into because he had metric skills. That was the only reason. And after he retired, he decided um, he lived on a house on the side. He still lives there. He's now 70. He's now 87. He lives, the house he lives in is on the side of a hill that slopes into the Hudson River. And he decided in his retirement he would build a seawall to protect his property against encroachments of the Hudson River. And um, he spent a year carrying cement down this mm. very steep hill and material to build the wall. And when he was done, he, had, um, he stepped back into the water at low tide one day and thought the war wall looked blank and at that moment looked down into the water and saw a beautiful stone and he picked it up and went and got uh, a broken lawnmower blade and a hammer and chiseled a face oh. into the stone and plastered oh. it onto the wall. Oh. And the next day he returned and thinking he'd be overjoyed but when he looked at it he felt the face looked lonely because it was by itself. And so he <laughs> went in search of another. Um, and then fast forward Many years later, there are now, I think, about 160 statues of all sizes on his property. He's collected uh, by museums around the country, um, and he's a remarkable sculptor. And, uh -huh. um, and he's, still, he's still sculpting. Yeah. And the, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating story, too, because when you try to understand, in passing, when I was interviewing him, um, I, wa I asked him, as I often ask people, a question of if they believed in God. And he said, not after the war. And the first time I interviewed him, that kind of got by me. And when I went back a second time, it, it kind of, I started thinking about what happened to Otvok and his friends. And we talked about it. And um, because all of his sculpture is of faces, it's as if he's repopulating mm -hmm. the earth with the people that hmm. were lost. Huh. Um, and you mean that's the way he saw it? Well, I, th I asked him about that. He's, he, he, he's not sure. He <laughs> never really thought about it till okay. I asked the question, but um, it's the way I interpret it, to be uh -huh. honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned the woman who um, has collected erotic art. Naomi Wilson. Which I thought, I thought that was... That was a wonderful story too. Yeah, she yeah. was. She's. She was I, a great I think character. Wasn't that her husband never really saw her erotic art? Well, he saw it, but he Finally. he did see it, but he uh, didn't approve. He also, interestingly enough, um, by coincidence, has a Holocaust story attached to him. He was a Holocaust survivor, and um, Naomi married him uh, in the when she was a young girl in the 50s, she was 17, 18 when they met, he was a little bit older. But he went from being a peddler to ending up eventually uh, owning the New Jersey um, 
trust company and a mm -hmm. very large oil reserve mm -hmm. over time. Uh -huh. But he had this power position, both mm -hmm. in their lives as a family and in the community. And he didn't want anything to taint it. And he wanted her to be a perfect 10 as a woman. But she was a Zoftic woman. She had a little heaviness to her. So she would go away every weekend to spas to try to trim down or, um, and to, to meet his standards. Um, and one time when she was at this spa, she um, happened to pick up a magazine that had an advertisement for a nudist colony. <laughs> and by, she just, for whatever reason, decided she would call up and find out if she too could go to this nudist <laughs> colony. And she did, and they said, sure, all you have to do is pay your $10. And she said, what do I have to bring? And they said, bring a towel and a beach chair. And sh off she went one weekend to Haddonfield, New Jersey, um, at the end of a road, at the end of a road, and uh, was met by two gentlemen at the gate to the place and mm -hmm. asked, um, she directed to the Sunfield, and there she saw before her. Now, this was a woman who was brought up in an Orthodox Jewish family <laughs> where there were no graven images or Forgot anything. That, right. And um, she looked out and she suddenly saw this field of naked people and realized that no one's a perfect 10, that there, there are no bodies that are perfect. And she mm. tells this very amusing story about summoning the nerve to go down and sit in her chair and. As soon as she was there, a gentleman came over and um, asked her if she wanted to go take a walk in the woods with her. And, and she said, no, I'm, I'm allergic to bugs. Um, but mm. she went from there, she began, her son, uh, I won't go into the old story, asked her if she could find a piece of erotic art. And that took her about a year to summon the nerve to ask for one. And she ended up finding um, a Japanese chunga book, which is a marital book that was a, basically a guide to sex. Uh -huh. um, in one direction, it had the wealthy costumed um, in various positions. In the other direction, it had peasants um, uh -huh. and showed same positions, but just <laughs> different costumes. And um, she, she became fascinated and interested and began mm -hmm. using her money to collect and eventually collected uh, a collection that was worth about five or ten million dollars. Spent five years working against all kinds of things to open up the World Erotic Art Museum in Miami, mm -hmm. which is a marvel to see. I mean, you feel when you walk in it, which I did with her, you feel a little spacey when you're done. You go through a room of 150 uh, Lita and the Swan paintings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh, well. Wonderful story. And she's become book. a huge advocate, too, for human sexuality, and she lectures. Mm -hmm. So in each of these stories, too, mm -hmm. you see this great evolution that happens in late right. life where people transform. It's not just that they, you know, when I started my idea of success, I think, was very basic. As I b b worked on these stories, it changed my notion of what success is. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and it was more, as you say, about the evolution and the transformation right. of people's lives. Right. So now that the book has been out for a couple years or something, yes. hasn't it? Yes. How how do you think it's affected you thinking about these stories? Well, it, it affects me all the time because I still, like most people, am trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And um, as a writer, you're always up against that. Uh, what are you going to do next, and how are you going to pay the bills? And um, I learned I learned lessons about how to really achieve things. So by setting goals, by having aspirations, by being disciplined, um, by dreaming big sometimes, mm -hmm. um, by not by not letting uh, naysayers get in the way, by s surrounding yourself with people who affirm what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, that that seems a very important piece of this um, in looking at the people that I wrote about, that uh, often once they began to do the things that they did uh, and set themselves inside communities, or sometimes communities kind of formed around them, sometimes they created the communities, Mm -hmm. they received this kind of affirmation of what they were doing that really helped propel them. Mm. And I think that that's an essential ingredient. They followed their cure. One of the 
people often ask uh, when I do when I speak, they ask me, well, what should I do? I know I want to do something. What can I do? How can I do it? And I always tell people the first thing they should do is think about what they're curious about mm -hmm. and follow their curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, what about people who don't seem to be curious about anything? They're just in their own status quo place and they don't seem to want to move out of it. Well, I mean, if someone doesn't want to move, there's not much that you're going to be able to mm -hmm. do, I suspect. But if someone has a desire but says, mm -hmm. I don't know, um, and says, I don't feel curious. And I've had those people who've said, mm -hmm. I, I don't have a clue. or I don't. So really, as, in, as you know, I'm a m member and active in Life Planning Network, where, and we recently published um, Live Smart After 50, a mm -hmm. book. And, one of the commandments, I would say, of that book, the, certainly the start of the process, is in a self-analysis of asking yourself, of interrogating yourself about your life a little, about what you wanted to do when you were younger, what got in the way, understanding mm -hmm. your own story, and putting out your ideas about what, you know, you, it takes a little bit of challenge and risk. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is, in my book, I tried to write about and I continue to explore how the brain um, is affected as we age by what we do. Mm. Um, it's yeah. a major issue, you know, we've all heard the reports of the projections of how Alzheimer's is going to affect uh, more and more people and become a major, um, it already is a major social issue, it's going to become an, mm. a, a giant one unless something right. changes. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, I learned and science verifies is how important it is to um, challenge yourself in novel ways. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons why that apparently is true. Uh, there's a wonderful neuroscientist named Denise Park in Dallas who has a theory about what's called scaffolding. And that even as we age, if parts of the neural networks um, cease to function as they did in the past, if you've created enough neural scaffolding, it won't be noticed. I mean, th these they're mm -hmm. all theories, basically, but mm -hmm. sure. there's enough to support that idea. Um, some people call it cognitive reserve, this idea of building. But one thing that we seem to know uh, is that challenge is what creates that cognitive mm -hmm. reserve and structure, the right. continuing challenge. Right. Right, so doing things that are at least a little bit new. Yeah, for new, you. challenging, having mm -hmm. conversations that are uncomfortable sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, fear often gets in the way of people doing um, things that they dream of doing. Mm. But fear really is something people might think about embracing more. Mm -hmm. um, that it, if they befriend the idea, that fear is, is telling them that it's worth taking a little bit of a risk sometimes, that mm -hmm. those things that you'll risk, learning a new language, learning to play an instrument, learning as mm -hmm. you did to take up art or, you know, put yourself in a new environment, mm -hmm. something that's a little uncomfortable actually can have great benefit for you and it's worth doing. Yeah, well it certainly has had great benefit for me because, uh, you know, as I've told you, I've started all kinds of new things in the last few years and I'm so much happier than I ever was in my 20s and 30s. <laughs> well. Yeah. So, and there, as you say, I'm glad you brought that up about you know the um, all the neurological research that is has been done now on just thinking about how people age. Right. And you know, of course, we always had the assumption that people get more set in their ways as they age. But indeed, it's not true at all. No. People. That is, if people challenge themselves and do something new, because our brains are very plastic. Yep. And yeah. And so exercise is, of course, a, a key component of that, which mm -hmm. is why one of the reasons I became interested in dance, as you know, um, partially been when I was writing uh, the story of Thomas Dwyer and was asking myself in each of these stories, what is this doing for <coughs> the brain of this person? And came mm. across the research. Um, that showed that dance, uh, the Einstein aging study, 
um, at Einstein Medical College, which was a 21-year study that looked at activities and how it affected outcomes of dementia. And in that case, okay. dance was an outlier. It, yeah. it protected the brain more than anything else did huh. if done regularly right. Right. and consistently. Yeah. And now there have been remarkable studies to that effect. I know. Yeah. Well, we have come to the en end of our time here. Well, we have much more that we could be talking about. It was the delight. Well, thank Very you happy. so much for coming, Bruce. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so join me next time when I will have a new guest for you on A Livelihood.